Alicia, hello, hello. Katie, good to see you here on time. <laughs> Ray, what's up, buddy? Wade Mains. Karen, good to see you on here. Dina, good evening, good evening. Gunner, what's up, buddy? Clinton Cantrell. What's up, Jay Gold? Man, nothing. Just ready for tr church part two. Hello, Wade. Good to see you. Kenneth, hello, buddy. Good evening, Karen. How's everybody doing? The sun's about to go down and get out of my face. Everybody's coming in on time. That's good. There's Cass. Uh, Twizzy Mac, what's up, buddy? You're in Dallas now, right? Got a prayer request, my brother. Give it to me, man. Now's a good time for it. What you got, Ray? What's the prayer request? What is the prayer request? Natalia. Just fed us some good tacos tonight. preach but I'm going to man you know how we do it <laughs> I'm going to we're going to go some deep 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 hey babe good to see you on here Alicia I can say your name now <laughs> okay Ray what you got a friend of mine grandmother has terminal cancer okay what is her first name Ray Twizzy Mac got you man I got to see you man Olivia what's up gangsta Alicia, hey buddy. <laughs> so glad I got your name. Alicia. And another friend has a missing son. Oh man, you'll have to put, uh, Elrod, good to see you buddy. Ray, you need to put both their names on there so we can pray for them. So somebody's got terminal cancer and somebody has a missing son. So let's get those names on here so we can pray whenever we get started. Brett Brown, good to see you. Hope everybody's doing well. Carissa Kimbrough, man, good to see you, Carissa. Carissa, I don't know if I've seen you on here before, but welcome. I'm glad to see you here. <laughs> Alicia. <laughs> that name was really bothering me a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. Now it looks so easy. Uh, there's Sharon. Good to see you on here, Sharon. Man, I miss you guys. I haven't seen you on forever. Let's see, 8.03, we'll give it a few more minutes with both kiddos. Uh-oh, Arya Michaela's there. James Grover, good to see you. Love you, brother. We'll catch up soon. God bless you, my friend. God bless you, Twizzy. Tamara Cook, always love seeing you here. Sherry, my sister. Virginia Lane, good evening, good evening. Kyle Campbell, what's up, Trouble? Janice Turner is watching. Man, Tuesday night seemed to be doing pretty good. Everybody logs on quick. Howdy, howdy. Big dog, Jason. <laughs> Mia, man, good to see you, Mia. You have had some awesome posts here lately. I sure love uh, reading your stuff. Mia, how old are you? You're like 14, I think, something like that. How old are you, Mia? Y'all should go check out Mia's page and read what she has to say. That girl has got wisdom beyond her years. Uh, Katie, please pray for my dad, Ed Hester. My whole life, I've prayed for him to believe and get saved. He's an atheist. Oh, man. Okay, I got to memorize his name. Ed, 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 Ed. Cynthia, good to see you. Did you enjoy your day off? I did. I worked hard at doing absolutely nothing. Just stayed at home and spent time with the wife and the kiddos. Played with the kiddos a lot. Let the baby take a nap on me. It was a good day, good chill day. Then Natalia came over and fed us some tacos. Just... It was a really good, relaxing, lazy day, which I don't do very often. I'm not very good at being lazy, but I needed a lazy day. Praise God. Bring up the youth. Wayne, what's up, buddy? Tuesday does seem to work great. Man, Tuesday's much better. Okay, I guess we're going to stick with Tuesdays. Tuesday's my day off. I get plenty of time to rest and get ready for truck church at night. So maybe we'll stick with Tuesdays. It seems to be going pretty good. Jason Davis, what's up, buddy? Uh, we'll just do a couple more minutes. Uh, Ray, if you're still on here, man, we need some names, man. That way we can pray. You said somebody's got terminal cancer and somebody is missing their son. And then Katie's dad, Ed, we're going to be praying for him that he would get saved. Katie, how old is your dad? Just out of curiosity. Cameron, man, that dude gave me a, 
a bite to chew on this week. I'm going to share that whenever we get started. Appreciate your messages this week, Cameron. Katie Hester. Okay, let's see. See more. Um, and I have too many siblings for you to remember all their names, but all four of my siblings are not saved. My family needs lots of prayers. Jenny Cole. Mama. Trevor, what's up, dude? Good to see you. Katie, your dad is 60 years old, so we're going to pray for Katie's 60-year-old dad named Ed that he would get saved. He's an atheist. You said, so we're going to pray for him, and if... Ray will put some names on here for us. Maybe he got busy and had to go. Naomi, good to see you, girl. Ray, if you're still here, put some names on here because I'm going to pray here in about one one minute, maybe two. Keep praying for my grandma, brother. She's still recovering. Kyle, is she in the hospital or is she home? Let me know. We'll get started here in just a minute. Uh, Katie Hester, I'll be praying for your family. May Jesus come visit them all. Amen. Awesome. All right, we have people praying for them already. Ray, I don't know what happened to you, man, but if you come on later, uh, give us those names so we can pray for them. David Thompson, good to see you, buddy. She's at the house. Okay, so she's at home, but she's still recovering. That's Grandma. All right, one more minute here. We'll get started. Get some lights going since the sun's going down. Hoo-wee. Man, what did y'all think about last week when we started this topic about illusions, those of y'all that were here? I'll do a quick recap. I say quick. I'm going to try to do a quick recap and then give you uh, two more goodies to think about this week. But what did y'all think about that topic, illusions? Man, I have thoroughly enjoyed it and want to keep going. Wendy Ellis, keep me in your prayers, please. Got some news today and has me worried. Okay, that very first truck church we did was on fear. So if you haven't already, Wendy, you may already have. I don't know. I haven't looked. Esmeralda, good to see you on here. I hope you're doing well. Love you, sister. Um, Wendy, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, I do these truck church videos, and then the next day I'll turn them into YouTube videos. So if you go find my channel, the very first one uh, was on fear. I think it was called um, a virus worse than corona or something like that, but it was, it was on fear. I want you to see that. Esmeralda. I love you. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started here in a second. But y'all have, uh, hopefully y'all have enjoyed that topic last week, Illusions. We're going to do part two today. So I'll do a quick recap here in a minute because we got some people that weren't here last week. Do a quick recap and then give you a couple more Illusions. It's fascinating. It absolutely is. And what's crazy about it is I'm just now finding out about it after 12 years of being saved or 13 years being saved, 12 years of preaching. I'm just now finding out about illusions, and illusions is the way that uh, Jewish rabbis teach. So I should have learned this a long time ago, but nobody taught me. That was our saying last week. If you don't know the rules of the game, you can't play. Um, I know with God all things are possible, so thanks everyone for the prayers. God is good all the time. Wendy, yes, I'm subscribed, and I've saved all your videos. Okay, Wendy, go back and watch that first one, okay? Go back and watch that first one while you're going through this time where you're worried. I'm listening while washing uh, washing dishes and getting kids ready for bed. If anything, I will rewatch for sure. It's my to miss you. I miss you too. Joseph, say hi. What's up, buddy? Uh, hey, jo uh, J -J Joseph, the girl Jamie from Driven Life Church, the one you laid hands on in the wheelchair. Uh, Joseph was led by God a couple Sundays ago to lay hands on this girl in the wheelchair. And God healed her and she was not able to, to get up, stand, or walk. And uh, he told her to get up and do something that she's never done before. And she got up and walked out of that wheelchair, which was amazing. And now she is in the hospital, Joseph, with um, COVID. She's actually got COVID. So we need to pray for her. It's just Satan trying to take her out whenever God just gave her that miracle. So we're going to pray for her healing too. Christian Kirby. Man, good to see you on here, Christian. My favorite waitress whenever uh, Lone Star Cafe was still open. BJ, we are here. Hey, man. Last week was amazing. Okay, thank you. Homer Morgan. Man, one of my favorite preachers right there. Round Flat Pentecostal Church. We're ready. Nick, we we're waiting on you, dude. We're going to get started now. now. <laughs> okay, brother Homer, if you're still on here, man, if you didn't get to watch last week, I hope you get back, get to go back and watch it because uh, it was on this topic of illusions. So I'm going to do a quick recap, but it's just got me super excited about the word, even more so than before. Okay, Ray. Sorry, J. Amon Williams is the young man's name that's missing. We'll have to go with Meemaw for the grandmother. Meemaw, okay. So, J. Amon Williams. Man, I hope I can remember that here in a second. Chloe said hi and good night. Chloe, good night, sweet girl. I just got off the phone with her. How do you pray for healing in her body? 
oh sorry uh, probably how do you pray for her healing goodness gracious this thread is going too fast and she feel the Lord touch her body so now we're just waiting to hear an update okay awesome Tanya Watkins one of my favorite sisters I love you girl Howard good to see you not how I just did okay you just prayed for her. okay let's go we got lots of people here we need to get in the word okay well I'm excited part two of illusions let's pray <clears throat> Williams Jay Williams is who we're praying for oh Jason I wanted to say thank you one of the guys from your page messaged me and brought out a box to help out such a blessing oh man that's awesome that's freaking awesome Tamara yeah, we were looking for some food banks. Daniel Sullivan, man, I was hoping you would be here. You've always got some good input, and he understands a lot of this stuff on illusions. So I'm going to cover one of them that you uh, you got a little bit ahead of me last week. I'm going to cover some of that. So if you want to add to that, you are welcome to. If I'm, if I miss something, please jump in. Becky, good to see you from North Carolina. All right, let's go. I've spent 11 min minutes talking. Lord God, I just thank you for this day that you've given us and blessed us with. Um, I thank you for last week. I thank you for this topic called illusions. Um, something that's taken me 12 or 13 years. Well, actually, I've been in church my whole life, but been saved 13, been preaching for 12, and, and just learned about this topic called illusions, which is exactly how you taught when you were on this earth, and it's how Jewish rabbis teach all the time. And uh, we're just missing it here in the Western world, not knowing our Jewish roots and culture, Lord God. So I just pray today, like always, that you would take over my train of thought, that you would give me fresh revelation, fresh word, even in the moment as I'm preaching, Lord, brand new stuff. Help to bring back to remembrance all the things you've taught me over the last two weeks. Um, I pray for um, my tongue, that you would just take over my mouth, that it would say the things that you would want me to say and keep my feelings and my emotions out of it, Lord God, just stick to the truth. Thank you for Truck Church. Thank you for this ministry that you created because uh, COVID happened and we couldn't go to church and people wanted, reached out and asked if we would start doing something online. And now that we can go to church, we're just continue to do it. Thank you for Truck Church. Thank you for uh, this opportunity, this platform to bring the word and your word is uh, the power unto salvation, your word says in Romans. And I just pray for everybody that's watching now that you would give us ears to hear, Father God. Give us eyes to see, Father. Lord, let it, let it be clear. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be at work. No matter what I'm saying, Lord God, you have this amazing way to use the things that I'm saying to impact people. An amazing way. Um, I can say one thing, but Lord, you can hit their heart with something that, that I didn't even necessarily say. And you always meet us right where we're at, Father God. So I just pray for everybody listening now and later on the replay that you would bless us with your word. Touch us right where we're at in our lives and give us something that we can use. And I pray that you would give me the ability to teach it in a way to where people can leave truck church and teach this to their friends at work or even their family, Lord God. Right now we lift up Ed to you, Katie's 60-year-old father that is not only um, lost, but he's an atheist. So I pray for him in the name of Jesus that you would send people to him to love on him, uh, to convict his heart that he is a sinner that needs you, Father God, that you would just open up the windows of heaven and just send so many messengers to him to where he could not refuse your gift of salvation. I pray for all of her siblings, Lord, there's four of them that don't know you, and you know them by name, Father God, and I just pray that you would just move heaven and earth to run them down and save them, and that they would see your joy and your hope and your salvation in Katie, Father God. Lord, I lift up to you right now, um, Jay Williams to you, Lord, uh, this young man that is missing right now. I pray that he would be found soon, even tonight, before we get off truck church. I pray that he is found, and we have a testimony to give you praise, honor, and glory for that. And we pray for uh, Mima. We don't know her name, but this grandma that has terminal cancer, Father God, if it's your will to heal her, I pray that you would touch her even now as we are gathered and we're praying together in agreement, Lord, that you would just heal her, Lord God. Thank you for um, sending people to my friend Tamara to help her out in her time of need, Lord. Thank you for all the praise reports that have come from church. church. Several people gotten saved and I've gotten baptized, Lord God, and you've just turned their lives around. I thank you for all the praise reports of truck church. Uh, Father God, just it's just who you are and it's what you do. So I thank you for this next uh, however much time that we spend in your word, that you would teach us new things, Father God, and we give you praise, honor, and glory for it, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Oh, I lift up Wendy to you right now, Lord. Whatever situation is going on in her life that's causing her to worry, to fear, Lord God, I pray that she'd remember your word, that you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind, and uh, that she'd be able to go back and watch that very first truck church, Lord, and just be uplifted and encouraged and just face this thing knowing that with her and God, she is the majority, Father God. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen, amen. Who came on here? Stephanie Young, my sister, man. I love you, Stephanie. Marty, good to see you on here. I uh, got the hoods from way up north. Brandon Clark. Cricket is here. Billy Wayne. Billy Wayne. Man, you need to go back and watch last week's truck church, man. It'll change the way you preach, man. It's insane what we learned last week. Uh, okay, I think that's everybody. If I missed you, I'm sorry. We need to get started. Let's roll. Let's roll. All right. So, uh, if you don't have pen and paper, try to run and get it real quick. Run and get your pen and paper. We're going to cover some good stuff that you may or may not have ever heard before. Last week was brand new stuff for me. Billy, so good to see you on here. He is Jason. Actually, uh, Tamara actually met Billy a couple of years ago. Me and um, Leroy heard about the uh, halfway house, transitional house that he had up in Dallas. And we went up there to visit him and I was blown away. You talk about church. The boys in his house, man, they know how to do it, man. They know how to praise and worship and have church. And uh, so I love Billy Wayne, even though I hadn't got to see him, but that one time, I'll never forget him. But uh, Billy, you ought to go back and watch last week's truck church. This is gonna be part two, but it's this thing called illusions. And so we'll just jump right in here right now. Um, so what I found out last week, doing some research, praying about what in the world we're gonna do truck church on. And then I didn't really have a, a topic in my mind or in my spirit. So um, I just started man, just doing all kinds of different research. And I stumbled upon this, Tanya, you ready? <laughs> I love you, girl. <laughs> I stumbled upon this topic and it's called illusions with an A, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. The Hebrew word for it is remez, R-E-M-E-Z, I believe. But illusions is a Jewish rabbi way of teaching to where unlike here in America where we read a phrase in the Bible, we take it for black and white, and we try to apply it back then, and we try to apply it today. Um, it's very much like our school systems, our educational systems. Uh, we, we read something, we teach that, it is what it is. It doesn't really get any deeper than what we just read and talked about. That's the way that we teach. Well, Jewish culture, um, Jewish rabbis, they, Jesus himself taught with this technique that we would say in English, an illusion, not an I, which is like magic or trickery or whatever. It's with an A, illusion. So the root word would be elude. So even though they say this particular phrase, the real heart and meat of the message is somewhere else. So the phrase that they say out of their mouth is actually alluding to something that is somewhere else, a deeper, um, more elaborate uh, truth or teaching, okay? Um, the Martinez is good to see y'all on her. Deidre, good to see you on here too. This topic has just got me so excited because I've always taken the Bible for black and white. I know that you can take the Old Testament and the New Testament and, and uh, mesh them together. I know that the Old Testament is foreshadowing of things to come in the New Testament. I know that once the New Testament came, once Jesus came, I know that the Old Testament wasn't done away with. I knew things like that, but I had no idea that there was even a technique that Jewish rabbis used, uh, namely Jesus is who I'm gonna stick with, I never knew that there was this technique called remez or illusions to where they might say this, but actually what they're referring to, if you want the meat of the message what's being said, you have to know scripture. So keep this in mind as we're going through this today. Jesus was not teaching in an American church where very few people knew the word or what people did know the word, um, knew very little of it. He wasn't talking to somebody that didn't know much about Jewish culture. He wasn't talking to a group of people that didn't know Jewish uh, history. But here's the, here's the key. Jesus was not talking to a group of people that barely knew the word, okay? Jesus was talking to a group of people we would call Jews, okay? And Jews, you have to keep in remembrance while we're going through this today. The crowd of people that Jesus was talking to were Jews and Jews, had the entire Old Testament, what you and I call the Old Testament, they had it memorized by the age of 15. Let me say that again, because that's going to, uh, that's going to set the foundation of where we're going. Jesus was not speaking to an American church that did not know the word of God, Jewish culture, Jewish history. When Jesus was preaching, when Jewish rabbis were teaching, they were teaching to predominantly Jews. And Jews had what you and I call the Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible, they had it memorized verbatim. So when Jesus is teaching, he is teaching to a group of people who have the Old Testament 
Bible memorized, okay? So when Jesus would say something in the New Testament and he would hit a phrase, whenever he said that phrase, that was not always the message or at least the heart and the meat of the message. That phrase would trigger their Bible Rolodex and they would their minds would go to the Old Testament where that scripture was originally quoted. And because they had the Bible memorized, their Bible brains would go before that, the phrase that Jesus actually used, and then it would go after that. And there would be the context of the message. So there were phrases like this. I gave an example of a uh, documentary, this Jewish rabbi, and I'm going to try my hardest to do a, a uh, semi-fast um, uh, recap of last week. So there was this um, documentary, and it was this Jewish rabbi who purposefully raised Jewish disciples to be able to not only memorize scripture, but to take that scripture and authenticate the Bible and authenticate that Jesus was real. <clears throat> one, of, one of his most uh, predominant, um, what would you call him, prodigies, I guess you could say, one of his best disciples that he ever had, whenever he came of age to go on his own way, something happens and it doesn't say what that something is. But when he goes away, instead of using all the tools that this rabbi had given him to authenticate the word of God and authenticate that Jesus was who he said he was, this disciple took all that information, wisdom, and knowledge and did the opposite with it. Out of his hurt, he actually set out to try to disprove God and try to disprove um, Jesus and the word of God. So he got interviewed <clears throat> and the interviewer asked him, Rabbi, whatever, you raised your children to, you raised your disciples to uh, take the word of God to authenticate the word of God and authenticate who Jesus was. Your, your most prominent one actually took everything you gave him and tried to set out to disprove God, confuse people, and disprove the Bible. How does that make you feel? And that rabbi says this, he says, I reared up or I raised children and I brought them up. That's all he said. Obviously the interview was, was wanting something more heated. This interview was trying to get a rise out of him. This guy was trying to go deep dish on him so a bunch of feelings and emotions would come out. The best disciple you ever had took everything you gave him and chose to use that for evil. He tried to discredit God, discredit the word of God, and discredit everything that you taught him. How does that make you feel, Rabbi? And the rabbi says, I reared up children and I brought them up. And he left it at that. He had nothing else to say. And of course the interviewer didn't know what to do with that. And so our slogan for this uh, topic called illusions has been, if you don't know the rules, you can't play the game. If you don't know the rules, you can't play the game. What does that mean? If you don't know your word, if you don't know the Bible, the way that Jewish people were raised up to know the word of God, having it memorized, knowing it, not just knowing it, but having it memorized. If you don't know the rules of the game, you can't play the game. If you don't know the rules, you can't play the game. If you don't know your word, you're lost whenever somebody is teaching with this technique. So what the interviewer did not know was that the rabbi was actually given a message without giving the message. So if you'll turn in your Bibles real quick to Isaiah, and like I said, I'm gonna try to do a quick recap, not uh, get all into it again so we can get to the new stuff. But this is for all the new people so I don't completely lose them. So the interviewer says the best disciple that you ever had took all the information, the knowledge and wisdom that you gave him to prove the Bible to be true and to prove that Jesus was who he said he was. He took all that, turned it around and tried to discredit God and discredit the word of God. How does that make you feel? And the rabbi says, I reared up children and I brought them up. What the interviewer didn't know is that the rabbi was using a rabionic teaching tool called illusions. Any Jew that was listening to that interview, their Bible brain Rolodex would have took them to Isaiah chapter one, verse two that says, hear O heavens and give ear O earth for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished or raised and brought up children. He was, his quote was a phrase from the Old Testament book called Isaiah. The interview says, how does it make you feel that your disciple turned on you and used all your wisdom and information against you, against God, against the word of God? How does it make you feel? And he says, I nourished up children and I brought them up. The interviewer did not know he was actually quoting Isaiah chapter one, verse two. I have nourished and brought up children. So when the rabbi says, I have nourished and brought up children, that was not his full answer. He was alluding to Isaiah chapter one, verse two. 
that's the heart of the message. So he actually teaches something without ever having to say it. And what he taught comes after that. The second half of part two says, I have nursed and brought up children. And then it goes on to say, and they have rebelled against me. It goes on to verse four and says, alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, which is sin. A brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord and they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned backward. So the interviewer says, how does that make you feel, Rabbi? And all he says is, I have nourished and brought up children. And leaves it at that. The interviewer is confused. He doesn't even know what to do with that. The interviewer did not know, but what Jewish people knew was he was alluding. The answer was not, I nourished and brought up children. The answer was, what does that verse allude to? It alludes to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel. They have rebelled. They have gone backward. That was his answer. His answer was, how do I feel? I feel like he's a rebel. I feel like he has angered God. I feel like he has turned his back on me and God. And I feel like he is going backward. That was his answer. His verbal answer was, I've nursed and raised up children, which did not seem like an answer. It's almost like the guy was crazy or didn't understand the question. But in turn, the interviewer was the one who did not understand. Us over here in America are the ones who did not understand because we don't understand, one, the teaching tool technique called illusions, which the answer actually alludes to the deeper truth somewhere else. But if you don't know the rules of the game, you can't play the game. If you don't know your scripture, you don't understand whenever you're being taught to um, by a technique called illusions. So my friend Cameron sent me, he watched this the other day, and he sent me a message and it painted a good picture. And it said something like this, illusions with an eye, which is more uh, magic trickery, sleight of hand type stuff. He said, uh, illusions with an eye is when I paint the picture of what I want you to see. Illusions with an A is where I give you the materials and the tools and you paint the picture for yourself. So illusions is you say a phrase that alludes to something else. If you want to know the message or the heart of the message, you have to know the rules of the game so you can play the game. You have to know your word. You have to know where to go to get the heart of the message. And then we went off to, uh, we won't flip here. I'll just run through my notes real quick. After that, we went to uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And it's a context where Jesus is saying, come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay. So how we read that over here in America is, oh, just come to Jesus and he's going to give you rest. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be peachy king. But we don't know because we haven't been taught that Jesus was actually using, using the teaching technique called illusion. He said, come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He goes on to say later that he is gentle and humble. What we found out in that text was he was alluding to something else. When he says, and I will give you rest, we found out that Exodus chapter 33, verse 14, God is speaking, and he says, I will go before you, and I will give you rest. So if you're a Jew that knows your word of God and has it memorized, and you're listening to Jesus preaching, and you hear Jesus who says, me and the Father are one, uh, um, I only do the things that my father does. He's doing everything but coming out and just black and white saying, hey, you know what? Not only am I God's son, um, but I am God. He's just not coming out and saying that black and white to, to us, the way that we read the Bible, the way that we hear it on Sunday morning. We're not hearing Jesus come out and say, I am God. But if you were a Jew and you heard Jesus stand up and say, come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Their Bible brain, knowing that the rabbi is teaching with a technique called illusions, they know that I will give you rest is not the message. The message is alluded, alludes to the deeper truth. So their Bible brains kick in and take them to Exodus chapter 33, verse 14, that says, I, the Lord God, will go before you and I will give you rest. So God is the one who says, I will give you rest. Not this dude, Jesus. So what did Jesus really say? His words out of his mouth were, Come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. What the Jews heard was, come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, I am God. And as God, I will give you rest. <sighs> Can you imagine the, um, the offense that was taken by the Jews who hated Jesus and didn't stand for anything? They didn't believe he was the Messiah. He didn't come back as the king. He wasn't rescuing them from Roman um, oppression or slavery. 
this guy shows up and he's just this really cool teacher and he's super compassionate and all these things. He's not the Jesus, the Messiah that they were looking for. So in their minds, he's not Jesus. And this Jesus stands up and says, come to me and I will give you rest. Their Bible brains know that God is the one who promised to give rest. So they heard Jesus say, come to me, all you who are heavy laden. I am God. I will give you rest. Jesus did black and white say that he was God. You just don't hear it, see it, or understand it if you don't know the rabionic teaching tool called illusions or remez. Then we see him say that um, <clears throat> I, uh, we find out another verse in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 that says, um, I will give you rest for your souls if you choose and you obey me. So it's not as simple as come to Jesus and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus, learn his ways, choose his ways, obey what he says, and I will give you rest for your souls. So it was way deeper than, hey, I'm Jesus, come to me and I'll give you rest. It was an allusion to the deeper truth. If you want rest, you have to choose me, learn my ways, and obey me. Then I will give you rest for your souls. He goes on to say in Matthew that I am gentle and humble. And we found out from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, and Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, that Moses prophesied that a Messiah was going to come that was just like him. And he said that that Messiah was going to be gentle and humble. So when Jesus says, I am gentle and humble, what the Jews actually heard was, I am the Messiah, the one that Moses prophesied about. I am the one that is gentle and humble. So within a couple of verses, Jesus just, just, just has to say, I will give you rest and I am gentle and humble. That's all he has to say. That's not real deep in our English thinking minds. If you were a Jew, you didn't hear, I will give you rest. I am gentle and humble. You heard, I am God. I will give you rest when you choose me and you obey me. I am the Messiah that Moses prophesied about. And I am gentle and humble and lowly. You don't get that from just reading Matthew. If you don't know the rules of the game, you can't play the game. If you don't know the word of God, you can't play this technique called illusions. Matthew chapter 21 verses 15 to 16 said from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise which sounds like a very nice churchy beautiful thing to say but it actually alludes to Psalms chapter 8 2 that says it says that quote from out of the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise and then it goes on to say before and after that you are enemies of God and he will destroy you so when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, the Jews that had the Bible memorized, and they pose a question to him, and Jesus just says this real pretty phrase, out of the infants, um, out of the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. We read that and we're like, that doesn't even sound like it goes with the questions that the Pharisees asked him. What's going on here? Surely I'm not that dumb. How come I don't understand what Jesus is saying? Well, Jesus gave them an illusion. He gave them something very deep. You wanna know my answer to your question? I'm gonna give you something that's gonna to allude to the answer. So they ask him a hard question and Jesus comes back and says, out of the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. That alludes to Psalm chapter eight, verse two, which says that same phrase and then continues to say, you are enemies of God and he will destroy you. That was Jesus's answer. Do you see how different it is? It sounds like they ask him a hard question and Jesus says something pretty and churchy, out of the lips of children and uh, babes, um, you will ordain praise. It sounded very nice and sweet and compassionate, but what they heard was, you're enemies of God and he's gonna destroy you. This is the thing of illusions. We went to John chapter eight, verses two through six, and we're reading about, Jesus has just got done talking about, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. A bunch of love stuff, a bunch of compassion stuff, a bunch of mercy stuff. And then the Bible says, in an attempt to trick Jesus, they found a woman that was caught in adultery and caught in the very act, and they brought her to Jesus. So there's a woman that's caught in adultery. She is surrounded by uh, Jewish men that are all ready to stone her because the law says whenever someone is caught in adultery, you, sh you should stone them. A couple of things we didn't cover last week. I've talked to some people about it since then. It's pretty amazing to me that we only see the woman here that we're ready to stone. Where is the man that was caught in the act? Because legitimately, according to the law, 
whoever was caught in adultery, the man and the woman would have been brought before the public and they both would have been stoned. So we already have a problem with the heart and the intentions of those who brought the woman to be stoned because where's the man? Why did you let the man off of the hook? So the Bible says in an attempt to trick Jesus, the Pharisees caught this woman in the act of adultery in the very act and they bring her to Jesus and very sarcastically they say, Jesus, Moses says, according to the law, because Jesus has already said, I did not come to do away with the law, I came to fulfill it. So Jesus, they feel like they're backing Jesus into this corner and they tell him, um, basically, you've already said all this love and compassion stuff, but you've also said you didn't come to abolish the law. Here's this woman that was caught in the very act of adultery and they try to present the word of God to the word of God because we know that Jesus is the word of God made flesh. He is the living word of God. Everything that we read, Jesus is the living version of that. So they try to bring the word of God to the word of God and they say, Jesus, Moses said, according to the law, by the way, that uh, someone that's caught in the act of adultery is uh, guilty and um, um, needs to be stoned. That's what the law says. And then they say, but what do you say, teacher? They're being very sarcastic. So in their minds, they presented Jesus with two questions that he needed to answer. Is it the lovey-dovey stuff, love your neighbor, or is it do we keep the law? And we stoned this woman that was caught in adultery. Here's your two options, Jesus. Which is it? Because if he says the lovey-dovey stuff that I just preached about, then that means he's going against the law. If he says, well, yeah, y'all are right. The law says we need a stoner. Let's stone her. Now he's going against all the lovey-dovey compassion stuff that he just taught. They give him two options. They think they have him backed into a corner. And then Jesus picks neither one. And Jesus, it says that Jesus did not answer. Hey, Renee, he did not answer. Penny, hello. He does not answer them. He squats down on the ground and he begins to write in the sand. And over the years and hearing all this stuff preached, everybody has always wondered, what is he preaching in the sand? Uh, what is he drawing in the sand? And 99% of everything that I've ever heard come out of somebody's mouth trying to explain that is, well, we don't know. And if you don't know this theory of illusions where you're actually alluding to a deeper truth, you miss it. And then you go on and Jesus says, ye who are without sin cast the first stone and the people walk away. So it makes it sound like they backed Jesus into a corner and made him pick. Is it the lovey-dovey stuff or is it, do we keep the law? Which one is it? What do you say, teacher? It sounds like Jesus bows down and is doodling in the sand uh, to kill time and think of something fly to say is what it sounds like. And then, hello, Tammy. And then he stands up and says, ye who are without sin cast the first stone. And we read in the word of God that they all drop their stones and they walk off. That's, that's a cool picture. Um, but you got to keep in mind, these guys don't care about Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't respect him. These men are not going to drop their stones and walk away just because Jesus comes up with something fly and says, hey, anybody that doesn't have any sin, um, Y'all cast the first stone. They don't care about Jesus. They don't respect him whatsoever. They're not going to walk away just because of that. So to find the deep, deeper truth, now that we know about this teaching tool called illusions, now we know that when Jesus bows down and begins to doodle in the sand, he is doing something. This is one of the, the first times that I know of, maybe the only time, I'm not sure, where uh, he uses the teaching technique of illusions and never has to use words. He never had to use words this time. He just bows down and starts drawing in the sand. What we find out because of this teaching about drawing in the sand is Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13 says, um, well, let's just go there real quick. That way I don't chop it up. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13 says this. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Let me read that again. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken uh, the Lord, the fountain of the living waters. If you skip up to verse 10, because their Bible brains are going to go before and after what Jesus actually says. Leslie, you're late, but I'm only doing a recap. We haven't got to the new touch. New stuff yet. We're fixing to start the new stuff, so you're not technically late. You're good. Faith, good to see you. Jillian, good to see you. So the disciples catch this woman in adultery. They want to use this as an opportunity to trick Jesus. So they bring 
the woman caught in adultery to Jesus and they said, hey, you just preached all this lovey-dovey stuff, but you know, the law says this woman was caught in adul adultery and uh, that she should be punished by stoning. But what do you say, teacher, Vicki, good to see you, girl. I'm just doing a recap, so you're not really lost. I'm, I'm fixing to start the new stuff here in a minute. This is the last example. Jesus, you preached all this lovey-dovey stuff. This woman's caught in the law and uh, deserves to be stoned. So which one is it, Jesus? Is it the lovey-dovey stuff, love your neighbor, or do we keep the law and do we stone her? And the Bible says that Jesus did not answer them. He bowed down to the ground and began to write in the sand. Whenever he began to write in the sand, the people that Jesus is talking to are Jews. A lot of rabbis are in this crowd. So these rabbis and these Jews have the Bible memorized. So when Jesus goes down to the ground and begins to write in the dirt, their Bible brain Rolodex shoots them to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13, that says, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. What is Jesus writing in the sand when these Pharisees and Jews say, hey Jesus, is it the lovey-dovey stuff? Or do we uh, stone this woman? Because that's what the law says to do. He doesn't answer. He bows down. He begins to write in the sand. What is he? What is he writing in the sand? He's writing the names of the men who are holding rocks ready to stone this woman. And their Bible brains go to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. And what they're hearing as Jesus says nothing. What they're hearing as Jesus writes and he's writing their names. All those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of the living waters. That's where their brains went. And then their brains go before it and after it. So when you go up to verse 10 in Jeremiah chapter 17, they remembered the word of God saying, I, the Lord, search the heart. No, let's go up to verse 9. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Jesus, is it the lovey's dovey stuff? Or do we keep the law in stone? Or what do you say, teacher? And Jesus doesn't say a word and he bends down and he begins to write names in the sand. And as he's writing their names, the men who are holding stones, ready to kill this woman for her sin, Jesus begins to write their names in the sand and their Bible brains go because they have it memorized. They go to Jeremiah chapter 17. All those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. And their minds go to verses 9. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord God, test the minds. I know the thoughts, and I'm going to give to every man according to his deeds, to his ways, to his doings. That's what they heard while he was writing in the sand. Jesus didn't preach a message that day. Jesus did not have to use words to preach a message that day. All Jesus had to do to convict the hearts of the men that were ready to stone this woman was bend down and start drawing in the sand because of this teaching tool called illusions. It's not what Jesus says necessarily. It's not even what Jesus does necessarily. It's what he says or does what those things allude to. The message is what it alludes to. Jesus, is it lovey-dovey stuff or is it the law? Do we stone this woman? What do you say, teacher? We're trying to trick you. We, we got you. We got you cornered. What is it? And Jesus doesn't say a word and begins to draw names in the sand, names of the men that are holding the stones. And their brains go to Jeremiah chapter 17. All those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, for they have turned their backs on me. Verse 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? I test the hearts. I test the minds. I'm going to give accordingly to those, according to their deeds, according to their doings, according to the things that they have done. Jesus didn't say a word. He just drew names in the sand. And the message got preached loud and clear. And Jesus stood up. And he says, you guys who are without sin, cast the first stone. They didn't walk away because he said, you guys who are without sin, cast the first stone. They walked away because he was drawing their names in the sand and their Bible brains went to Jeremiah. And loud and clear, their Bible brains told them, your hearts are deceitfully wicked. I judge your heart, I judge your thought, I judge your minds. Y'all have departed from me and I'm writing your names, your names in the sand. So now that you know who I am, and now that you know what the message is, you who's without sin, cast the first stone. The second reason why they walked away has nothing to do with Jesus saying, you who without sin, cast your first stone. It has everything to do with what their Bible brain said. 
whenever they read that their hearts were deceitfully wicked, that they had departed from God, so their names were being written in the sand. And when he started bending down to write a second time, their minds now know who he is, that he knows their thoughts and their hearts, but also according to their deeds, he knows their deeds. Anybody that was willing to throw a stone that day, not only had their name written in the sand, but if they were to get ready to throw a stone or allude to the fact that they were fixing to throw a stone, Jesus was fixing to put their sin out there on front street. And then they would have been out there in the center getting ready to get stoned. They didn't drop their stones because Jesus said, ye who are without sin cast the first stone. They dropped it because if they kept on pursuing it, the next thing Jesus was going to do after drawing their names in the sand to let them know that their hearts were wicked and that he was going to judge them according to their deeds, they walked away because if they kept pursuing this, stoning this woman, their sins were fixing to get exposed and then they were going to be on center stage getting stoned. Anyway, there's another one there that uh, is probably pretty important. But if you go down and you read verse 18 in Jeremiah, it talks about um, it talks about forgiveness and things like that. And that's what I believe the woman heard that day who was called in adultery and according to the law uh, could have gotten stoned. Jeremiah 17, before it talks about those that have departed from them, their names will be written in the earth. But then it goes on 18 and it talks about um, love and forgiveness and, and that God will avenge you and he will go after those that are, are coming after you. And then, of course, you pick the story back up in John, and he tells the woman, where are your accusers? They're gone. I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. So it's just amazing, amazing teaching technique um, that we don't know here in America because, one, we're not Jews. We don't know our Jewish culture or history. I didn't even know the 13 years I've been saved, the 12 years that I've been preaching. I had no idea that there was a teaching technique, technique called illusions. So I've missed all this stuff. And we've all missed all this stuff, and preachers miss all this stuff because we just don't know it. So uh, that was part one um, last week, and I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do a short recap, but um, I was going to try. Uh, but I didn't want to lose anybody. We had a lot, uh, a lot of newer uh, viewers on here today that I hadn't seen before, so I didn't want them to be lost. So the good news is, is I only have two more for this week. So uh, hopefully the second half won't take as long as the recap did, but uh, we'll see. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. And I want you to find two things. That way it's easier for us to find. It, it, it won't be far. I think it's only going to be two books to your left or something like that. So keep your finger in a Zechariah chapter 9. So Matthew chapter 11 is where we're going to read what is the teaching tool. Zechariah is where we're going to go see what the illusion is. So two things. No one wants the meat anymore. Boy, you're absolutely right. Nobody wants to study to get the meat. Heavy duty. Cameron is the one who gave me that analogy about illusions and illusions. I missed a comment. I want to go back because David always says something good. Uh, David, in the law at the time only, the woman was stoned. David, I was not even aware of that. I thought the man and the woman got stoned, but um, I know that you know a lot of Jewish history and the law, so I'm going to go look that up when I get done just so I know because I thought the man and woman got stoned too. But if not, I just learned something else, and that's why I like truck church so much. I'm going to have to watch part one and then come back to this. What I heard caught my attention. I mean, it all does. Cynthia, part one was amazing. Um, part two is going to be good, too. And here we go. I'm still here, just so you know. Okay, Alicia, let me get a drink. We'll dive in. Yeah, uh, BJ, nobody wants the word, the meat, anymore. And um, I don't think people want to study and dig to go find it. I mean, what if what if to be a Christian, we had to be like a Jew and we had, we had to memorize the Old Testament? How many people would drop out then? But it makes me wonder what all else we're missing. This is amazing, and I am learning a lot about Jewish ways as my stepsister Holly is converted Jewish from Episcopal when marrying her husband, Matt. This is interesting, so I should talk to her more now. Awesome. Okay, so Matthew chapter 11 in one hand, and then uh, Zechariah chapter 9 in your other hand. That way we can flip back and forth and see this without spending a bunch of time flipping. Zechariah chapter 9. Okay, so this one's a little bit different. Same teaching technique, but uh, a little bit different. Man, everybody's hanging in there with me. I really appreciate you guys watching this and being interested. Okay, so here we go. So, um, John the Baptist is uh, Jesus' cousin. I think they were like six months apart. John is uh, called in the Bible, uh, mainly the peasant men got stoned. Okay. And it may come to that one day. It may come to that one day, right? Um, 
so it, if if that's true um uh, bj it, it makes sense for that to be true um because the only other thing we have the reason for the guy not to be there is them haven't shown partial um partiality so if it's in the law that only the woman gets stoned it makes sense for the man not to be there in the story um i'm just gonna have some trouble if a male was stoned uh i'm just gonna have to go research that because i'm fixing to go on a rabbit trail with my ruler uh brain uh, i just got some issues with why the man wouldn't be stoned if, if that's true there's other scriptures that are bugging me right now but that's good it's food for thought and i'm gonna go check it out so um all right here we go matthew chapter 11 verses 2 and 3 backdrop john the baptist is the forerunner he's jesus's cousin he's the guy that's supposed to come and preach about the coming Messiah. He's the guy that goes and he's gonna be the one to preach about. Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the one that's coming. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the one um, who is gonna die for your sins, okay? So, um, Debbie, I'm gonna go find that out, trust me, uh, cause I, I gotta know. So uh, I'll have that ready for next time. So John does everything that he's supposed to do. He's the forerunner, he preaches, he's got disciples before Jesus comes along, he's doing his thing. Well, John the Baptist was savage, man. He didn't care about nothing. I mean, he just wanted to do his due diligence to preach about Jesus, the coming Messiah. He was in love with Jesus, followed him uh, intently. But when it came to sin, he was not quiet about speaking up. Then he speaks up one day to the king and tells them that you're not right uh, marrying this woman because it's actually somebody else's woman. And they hated that. The woman despised John. The woman had a daughter. The daughter uh, has a birthday party and... Um, uh, John has been John has already been arrested because of what he said to the king. The king wanted to kill him, but he was scared if he killed him that there would be riots from all the Christians. So he just had him locked up at the time. The woman's daughter has a birthday, and it says that she danced in front of the king, and it pleased him well. And it pleased him so much, the dummy opened up his mouth and says, Anything you want, I will grant it to you. I believe it was 500 years from the prophecy of John till his birth. Okay? John the Baptist was a wild guy. <laughs> He absolutely was. So um, the daughter dances before the king, and it says that it pleased him so much that he opened his dumb mouth, and he says, anything you ask, I'll give you. And for her mother, the daughter says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Okay? So John the Baptist is locked up. He's locked up for speaking truth. He's locked up for doing what he was born, raised, and called to do, which was preach the gospel and preach about the coming of Jesus Christ and pointing and pointing to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That was his whole goal on earth. And he did it and he did it well and he wasn't scared of anything. And now all of a sudden John is locked up and now it's fixing to cost him his life. What he was called, boy, this is a hard truth right here. Your calling, your purpose, the one thing that God wants you to do in life. You're doing it. You're doing it to the best of your ability. You're doing it well. You're giving it all you got. Marcus, it's good to see you on here again, buddy. You're, you're doing your gifts. You're doing your calling. You're doing everything, and you're doing it well. And then it comes to the day that you're fixing to pay a penalty for what God has called you to do. And you haven't just been doing it, but you've been doing it well and giving it all that you've had. Now you're locked up for that gift and calling and purpose, doing it right, doing it honestly, being faithful in it. And now you're fixing to die. Now you're fixing to die because of the calling that God gave you. Man, that's hard to wrap your mind around. God, you called me to this. God, this was my calling. I'm supposed to be preaching uh, about you, pointing people to you. I did that. Now here I am in a jail cell. And now because this young chick danced real good in front of the king, now the king has ordered that uh, my head be served to the queen on a platter and they're coming for my head. That's the backdrop to the story. John the Baptist is locked up for proclaiming the gospel, for presenting truth to the, the king who was living in sin, and now they're fixing to kill him. And John says this. Now, you got to remember, again, another piece of a backdrop. All of John's life, he has been preaching about the good news. All of John's life, he's been pointing people to Christ. He's been telling people that the Messiah is coming. Follow him. The Son of God is here. Follow him. Okay? He's been doing that. His, his whole life was dedicated to that and doing it well. And then we find him in prison, and he's going to pose a very honest question. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, because now, now John the Baptist is locked up, 
Jesus and the disciples are still carrying the torch. They're still spreading the good news and healing people and all this stuff. So John had heard in prison about the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples. So John's got disciples. Jesus has disciples. John sent two of his disciples and said to him, him is capitalized. So he's, John sent two of his disciples. He's fixing to be killed for preaching the gospel and speaking truth to the king. While he's locked up, he hears that they're coming for his head. He also hears that Jesus and the disciples are still carrying the torch. So John is sitting in prison with way too much time to think, like any of us that have been locked up before can testify to. He's sitting in prison with way too much time to think. And he sends two of his disciples to deliver a message and or a question to Jesus. He sent two of his disciples and said to him, said to Jesus, are you the coming one? That John the Baptist is Jesus's cousin. They're six months apart. He spent his whole life preaching the good news, preaching about Jesus, warning people about Jesus, pointing towards Jesus. He, even his own disciples, he pointed everybody to Christ. That's the man. That's the Messiah. That's the one we've been waiting on. Follow him. Listen to him. Follow him with everything you got. That is the son of God. And then he's locked up for his calling. And he's sitting in prison with too much time to think. And he sends a question. It, seemingly, what I'm giving you is the American, the Americanized church version of this scripture. What I'm, what I'm giving you, what it sounds like, is Jesus is questioning who Jesus is. But that's not what he's doing, okay? Black and white, he's asking Jesus, are you really the coming one? Okay? But he uses specific phrases, because these are Jews that are talking to other Jews that have the Bible memorized. And they have a teaching tool called illusion. So what I say black and white may not necessarily be what I'm saying or asking. The real meat of what I'm saying or asking is an illusion. That, and you got to go find out what I'm alluding to to know what's going on. So the Americanized teaching, because we don't know our Jewish culture and history, it sounds like John the Baptist has worked out his calling. Now it's going to cost him his life. And since it's going to cost him his life, it sounds like John is questioning Jesus, are you really the coming one? Are you the Messiah? That's what it sounds like he's asking. That's not the question. That's what he said. That's what he asked. That was the message that he sent forth. But that's not the question that John is asking. And we don't know it. If we don't know the rules of the game, we can't play the game. Verse 2, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Jesus, are you the coming one or do we look for another? John the Baptist has spent his whole life testifying about Jesus Christ and now it's going to cost him his life. And what we read is John sends a message to Jesus to ask, are you the coming one? He uses a specific phrase. Are you the coming one or do we need to look for another? It sounds crystal clear that there's no way we can miss the meat of this message. It sounds crystal clear that John is second guessing who Jesus is. But we know that, G that Jesus and John are cousins. We know that John has spent his whole life testifying and pointing people towards Jesus. We know that John knows who Jesus is. We know that John believes in who Jesus is and his mission. But it looks very crystal clear, black and white, that because John is fixing to die for his faith and his calling and his purpose, it looks like John is questioning everything. Are you really the coming one or do we look for another? But John was alluding to something. John did have a question, but the question was not, are you the coming one? What he is alluding to, remember specifically he says, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Are you the coming one, the one who is to come? Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. We're going to read verses uh, 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Another version says, the King James says, Your king, the coming one. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, 
the foal of a donkey. You see here already, John is already letting you know that he knows who Jesus is because when Jesus comes into play, Jesus comes in on road, riding in on a colt, a donkey that has never been ridden before. So we already know right off the bat, John's not really questioning if he's the coming one because he's alluding to a scripture that already says you are the coming one and you're going to come in riding on a colt or a donkey. So that's not the question. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle, uh, this verse here is not technically important for what we're getting to, but we're going to keep on going. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 11 and 12. As for you also, because, now listen, this is John's question. John, this is not the answer. This is the question. John says, are you the coming one? Jesus, uh, John's question to Jesus is, are you really the coming one? So John's question alludes to Zechariah chapter 9 that says, as for you, one, you are the coming one. You're the one that rode in on the colt or the donkey. And then part two is, here's his real question. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I, re I will restore double to you. Let's read it again. Listen, John's question. This is John's question. In the American church, we read in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 to 3, John says, send a message to Jesus. Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Are you the coming one? The coming one alludes to Zechariah 9 verse 9 who says you are the coming one the one who rode in on the colt or the donkey so he's not questioning who he is but then when you get down because they know the verses before it and after verses 11 and for you also because of the blood of your covenant i will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit and then it and it goes on let me just prove my point john has spent his whole life preaching about jesus and pointing to jesus now john is locked up john is in in prison for walking out his calling, his gifts, his talents, his purpose. He's, he's pointed to Christ his whole entire life, and now he's locked up. He is a prisoner for following Christ, and he sends a message to Jesus that says, Are you the coming one? It sounds like he's questioning who Jesus is, but one, they're related. They're cousins. They're separated by six months, six months at birth. One, he physically knows who Jesus is because of family. Number two, his question, are you the coming one? He could have said, are you the Messiah? He could have said, are you really Jesus? He could have said, are you really the son of God? But he chose a specific phrase. Are you really the coming one? Because the coming one is an allusion to Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine. You are the king. You are the coming one. The one who rode in on the colt or the donkey. We've established that. John is not really asking, are you the coming one? John is in prison. He sends a message to Jesus to ask a question, are you the coming one? Because he knew the, the teaching technique called illusions, their Bible brains would go to Zechariah chapter nine that talks about the coming one. The real question we know from verses 11 and 12, you came to set the captives, the prisoners free. What is John's real question? John spent his whole life preaching about Jesus. Now he's locked up and he's about to die for walking out his calling. So he sends a question to Jesus. Are you the coming one? The question was not the coming one. The question was, Jesus, am I going to get out of prison? Jesus, are you really going to let me die here? Jesus, I have been walking out this calling. I have been preaching about you. I have been pointing people towards you all my life. My whole life has been dedicated to you, Jesus, and pointing people to you, Jesus. Are you the coming one is not the question. He's not questioning Jesus. He's alluding to Zechariah chapter 9 who says, you are the coming one who came in on the colt or the donkey. In that passage, the word says that you will set the prisoners free. John's question is not, are you the coming one? His question is, Jesus, are you really going to let me die in prison for preaching the gospel? Are you really going to let me die in prison for pointing people to you? It's all I've done all my life. His question is not, Jesus, are you the coming one? Are you the Messiah? Are you really the son of God? That's what it looks like to us that doesn't know G uh, Jewish culture. The question was, Jesus, 
Am I going to be one of those that you set free from prison? Am I really going to go out like this? Jesus, am I really going to die in prison for preaching the gospel and preaching about you? Jesus, Jesus, I know you're the coming one. Are you going to set me free from prison or am I going to die in here for walking out my calling? It's a whole nother message. It's a whole nother question. If you don't know the rules of the game, you can't play the game. If you don't know the scripture, you can't even understand what you're reading. Because it sounds like John is hurt and he's broken. I've, I've spent my whole life preaching and pointing people to you, Jesus. And now I'm fixing to die for it. Are you really the coming one or did I waste my time is what it sounds like you said. Are you really the coming one or do we look for another? Did I really waste my whole life preaching about you? Now I'm going to die for it? That wasn't the question at all. Are you the coming one? Was an allusion to Zechariah chapter 9 that says that he knows that you're the coming one, that you're the one who rode in on the colt and the donkey. The question is, in verse, is alluded to in verse 11 and 9. God setting the captives free. Jesus, are you going to set me free from prison? Are you going to set me free from prison or am I fixing to die? For preaching the gospel and so that was the real question not jesus are you really who you said you were the question was jesus am i going to get out of jail and then we got to go back to matthew chapter 11 to read jesus's reply matthew, that's deep stuff i don't that's hitting me hard man Ooh, that's hitting me hard Let's go to Matthew chapter 11 and figure out the reply. Man, it's good stuff, man. Preach it. We like the surface, the easy, and you can be saved by it. But to become closer to God and know him, we need to dig deeper, closer to his heart. Amen. Jesus, are you the coming one? Really means Jesus. Jesus, are you going to get me out of jail? And Jesus replies, verse 4 and 5, and he says this. It really makes no sense now, now that you know what the real question is, that the real question is, Jesus, am I going to get out of prison or am I going to die in here? We all have to be ready to step into John's shoes and die for the gospel. Amen. So now that you know the question is not really, are you the coming one? The real question is, Jesus, am I going to get out of prison? So Jesus' response makes even less sense now from our American way of teaching. Verse 4 Verse 3, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, doesn't say anything about getting you out of prison. The lame walk, doesn't say anything about getting you out of prison. The lepers are cleansed, doesn't say anything about getting you out of prison. And the deaf hear, doesn't say anything about getting you out of prison. And the dead are raised up doesn't say anything about getting you out of prison and the poor have the gospel preached to them doesn't say anything about getting them out of prison the blind see the lame walk lepers are cleansed the deaf hear the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19 Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Jesus, Jesus, are you the coming one? Am I going to get out of jail? Jesus responded, the dead will rise. The poor will have the gospel preached to them. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body there shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. This is what, this is what um, John is hearing in Jesus' response. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus. 
John spends his whole life preaching the gospel. Now he's fixing to die for preaching the gospel and he says, sends a message, Jesus, are you really the coming one? The coming one alludes to Zechariah chapter nine. You are the coming one, the one who came in on the colt and the donkey. And then it goes on to say, um, and I'm thinking about something else, Zechariah chapter nine. You set the captives free. You set the prisoners free. So his question was not, Jesus, are you the coming one? His question was, Jesus, am I going to get out of jail or am I fixing to die in this prison for walking out my calling? Jesus' response had nothing to do with getting out of jail. Jesus' response was, the dead will rise, the poor will be preached to, uh, the gospel will be preached to the poor. He never talks about prison. So what is being said there? He doesn't mention prison in any of his response in Matthew. So whenever John hears the message and his disciples come back to him when Jesus says to tell them the things that you hear, the dead will rise and the poor will be preached through the gospel. His brain goes over to Isaiah chapter 26 where it says that the dead will rise. Their bodies will rise with the rest of the dead. John ends, I'm sorry, Matthew uh, chapter 11. It ended with one verse I didn't really understand until the other day. Verse 6 says, And blessed is he who is not offended. That's the last message to John. Go back and tell John the things that you hear. The dead are going to rise. The lame are going to walk. The lepers are going to be cleansed. The poor are going to be preached the gospel. And blessed are those who are not offended by me. What, what do you mean offended by me? Um, saying that the deaf are going to hear is not offensive. Saying that the lame are going to walk is not offensive. Saying that lepers are going to be cleansed is not um, offensive. Um, saying that uh, the poor are going to have the gospel preached to them, that's not offensive. So what's offensive? What's offensive is, is the, the, the scriptures that Jesus alluded to was not about, John, you're going to get out of prison. The scriptures that he alluded to were, the dead are going to raise. The dead are going to rise again. The dead bodies are going to rise with the other dead bodies. What's offensive is not the words that Jesus said. What's of blessed are those who are not offended by the words that I say. What's offensive is not the words that Jesus said. What's offensive is the words that Jesus didn't say. What Jesus didn't say was, John, you're going to get out of prison. The scriptures that he sent back to John were about the dead rising again. So what Jesus didn't say, but he alluded to was, John, you're not getting out of prison. John, you are going to die in prison for my name's sake. Blessed are those who are not offended by the things that I say. Oof. Illusions. It's not what we're reading in the New Testament necessarily. It's what it alludes to, to where all the meat comes from. Last one, Matthew, the last one so far that I have. Matthew chapter um, 27. So, so in your left hand, I want you to go to Psalms 22. That's where we're going to allude to. We're going to do Matthew chapter 27, then we're going to do about three of them in John, and we'll be done. So go, I need a bookmark, because we're going to be doing flipping back and forth to get all this. So Psalms chapter 22 in your left hand. Tamara, what would you say? Jesus was saying the work to be done in prison and by John was greater than he could understand. Man, that's good stuff right there. Jesus, are you the coming one? I, I, I hope, man, I hope I'm not the only one, man. I hope this excites somebody else. Because, man, when I read it from my American brain, it sure sounds like John walked out his calling his whole life, and because it was going to cost him his life, he was questioning if Jesus really was who he said he was. Are you really the coming one, or do we look for somebody else? Did I just waste my entire life over nothing, or what? That's what my American way of thinking and learning and hearing on Sunday mornings, that's the way that I would have took it. And now that we're learning about this rabionic teaching tool called an illusion, Ramez, it's not necessarily what somebody says specifically, it's what, what they say alludes to if you really want to get the meat of the message. Like my buddy said, illusions is when I give you the materials and you go paint the picture for yourself. I say a phrase, your brain kicks over to what it alludes to in the Old Testament. 
you know the scriptures before that scripture and the ones after it, you paint your own picture. You understand what Jesus is really teaching. So John wasn't even saying, I wasted my whole time walking out my calling. Are you really the coming one or do we look for somebody else? His real question was alluding to Ezekiel. You are the coming one, the one who rode in on the donkey. Jesus, am I going to get out of jail? And Jesus says, you go back and you tell him the things that you hear. The dead will rise. The poor are going to get preached to. When John hears that, John's Bible brain goes to Isaiah to where the dead are going to rise one day. John, you're not getting out of prison. John, you're going to die in prison for my namesake. You're not getting out of prison. He answered him. If you just read it in the American way of reading and studying, it sounds like John is saying, are you really the coming one? And then Jesus answers with uh, the devil rise, the lepers will be cleansed, and the lame will walk, and we're going to preach to poor people. It, it sounds like there's a miscommunication going on. But there's actually a real legit, good, deep conversation there. It's really Jesus, am I going to get out of jail? And Jesus saying, no, John, you're not going to get out of jail. You're going to die for my namesake in that prison. And you don't see that conversation at all in the Gospel of Matthew. If you don't know the rules to the game, you can't play the game. So hopefully this is exciting to you guys too, because man, it just, man, it lights me up. I want to know what else I'm missing. All right, last one. So we can finish up and get in bed. So y'all got Psalms chapter 22 in your left hand. We're going to be alluding to Psalms chapter 22. And then with your right hand, we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 27. Give you a second to get there. So Psalms chapter 22 in your left hand. Matthew chapter 27 in your right hand. And then we'll do a couple more in John and be done. Yes, very exciting. The double blessing is finishing in a way that others want to follow by example. Amen. Yes, been waiting for Psalms 22. Well, here it is. Hopefully I'll do it justice. I will give it to you to the best of my ability that I understand it so far. <laughs> Next week, I might know more. Okay, here we go. Okay. So, uh, something I stumbled upon uh, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. There is this, uh, what do you call it? This was my first experience with illusion teaching. Daniel, okay, I'm counting on you right here. Uh, Jim, what'd you say? John, you were going to rise up with me. Yes. Daniel, this was my first experience with illusion. So, Daniel, I am going to depend on you here for this to keep me uh, on it. Tamara, for we all have our purpose, the body of Christ. God never said it would be fair or easy, but the only one true faith can carry out our purpose. All right, all right. Okay, so, Daniel, you keep me focused and on point. You want to add some stuff to it, add it, buddy, and I'll try to catch it in between all this stuff. But I've got uh, about four or five points, and then we'll see what we got. So there's this Jewish um, prayer, I guess. I'm trying to think of a way to uh, relate it to something that we would understand. There's this, uh, I'm just going to call it a prayer or a hope. There's this Jewish <laughs> prayer or hope. I can't think of the word I'm looking for. That um, that you would be granted the gift of dying with your favorite prayer or psalm on your lips. Okay, so it's not something I could call a tra tradition. It's not something I could call. I don't know. The the best two words I can come up with is it's this Jewish prayer, this Jewish hope that you would be granted the gift that in your death you would die with your favorite psalm. Or prayer on your lips basically you would go out praying your favorite scripture type of thing that's just a side note for where we're going because that's exactly what happened to Jesus but uh, I didn't even know that was a thing until I started studying illusions then started studying this whole thing with Psalms chapter 22 and then I find out a little bit more about the culture that that's actually something they wish or hope for um, in their death so when they're thinking of their death they pray that they are blessed with a gift to die with their favorite psalm um, scripture on their lips Matthew chapter 27 Matthew chapter 27 so get Psalms chapter 22 ready in your left hand ah. okay Matthew chapter 27 verse 46 I wish I had time to walk through everything that happened on the cross that's another message that's a powerful message 
but uh, we're going to stick to this whole topic called illusion real quick. Honor. Man, Cameron, thank you, buddy. That's the word. There's... The, hope that you have the honor. They want to have the honor of dying with their favorite psalm, their favorite scripture on their lips. The honor, that you would have the honor, that privilege of getting to do that. So uh, Psalm uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 46 says this. Uh, we'll start in 45 just for, to kind of keep everything in context. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabek thumni. I don't know how to say that. I'm sorry. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew. Chapter 27, verse 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is dying. It is a Jewish tradition, a Jewish honor to be able to die with your favorite psalm, your favorite scripture on your lips. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John chapter 19. Stay in Psalms 22 also. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. John 19, 26 and 27. John 19, 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother, from whom that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Psalms chapter 22, verses 9 and 10. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. John chapter 19. Now, we'll, since we're in Psalm, let's do Psalm verse. Psalm chapter uh, 22, verse 14 and 15. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Verses 14 and 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of my death. My tongue clings to my jaw. Ancient Hebrew scripture has no chapter or verse number. Yeah, that's very true. Yes, it is. My tongue clenches to my jaws. John chapter 19, verse 28. John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, but the scripture might be fulfilled. And he said, I thirst. I thirst. In Psalms chapter 22, it just says, My tongue clenches to my jaw. Psalms chapter, well, we're already in John. So John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Psalms chapter 22, verse 25. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. Verses 30 and 31. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. And he has done this. He has done this. I will fulfill my vows. John chapter 9 verse 30 says, it is finished. It is finished. Jesus decided, uh, uh, Jesus, he died reciting the text of scripture. I wrote this. I said, if, if his life is learning the text, living the text, teaching the text, 
praying the text and dying the text, which is all the things that we covered in the last two truck churches. I want to be like him. And my prayer is that we become men and women of the text. Jesus lived the text, learned the text, even though he was the word of God made flesh, he still spent time in the synagogues learning the text. He prayed the text and he died the text, even in his death. All the teaching tools that we went through, and we only covered like five or six, all the teaching tools that we went through, he says one thing, one type of phrase in the New Testament which is a piece of the message, but it's always alluding to the deeper truth, the deeper truth. And you've got to know the scripture. You got to know the rules to the game to play the game. You got to know the scripture to know where it alludes to, to get the real meat of the message. He lived his life. He lived the text. He taught the text. He prayed the text. And then we find out here in Matthew and in John that he even dies the text. He dies alluding to the text. In, even in his death, he has the honor of having the scriptures on his lips. Even in his death, he's dying to the text. Everything that he's saying in all those hours that he's dying on the cross, he's reciting and alluding to Psalms chapter 22 that was written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. He's not just dying on the cross. Nothing's wasted. God wastes nothing. He's not just dying on the cross, saying these things that come to him. And he was the text. That's good, Chris. <laughs> he, was, he was the text. He's dying on the cross. He's not just saying things, oh, oh, his mom just happened to walk up. And then the disciple whom he loved, John, walks up. And it, it's not just happenstance. Mother, your son, son, your mother. All that stuff, all the events of him dying on the cross was already prophesied hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago whenever David was out in a pasture somewhere taking care of sheep, pinning the Psalms 22. David is out there praising and worshiping God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, begins to pin Psalms 22. And David had no clue in that moment why he's inspired to write Psalms 22, that he is writing out the events of the last few hours of Jesus' life. So when Jesus is dying on the cross, there's nothing that is wasted. There's nothing that is happenstance. There's nothing that is a mistake there. Go through the hours that Jesus is dying on the cross and you can read Psalms chapter 22 and watch those events unfold at the same on the same timeline. He learned the text. He lived the text. He was the text. He prayed the text. He taught the text. He died the text. If Jesus is going to learn, live, teach, pray, and die the text, my prayer over the last two lessons of Truck Church on Illusions is that we would become men and women of the text. That we would, one, learn the scriptures so adequately that when we read the New Testament, we don't just get the black and white Sunday morning sermon, but we get, capture the illusion, go find it, and get the real meat in the message of what's going on. And two, that we would live the text, that we would live those sermons, that we would live these scriptures and have the honor of dying with those scriptures on our lips. It just makes me wonder what else is there. Where are we going to go from here? I don't know. I've got I've got books coming on this stuff. My studying has changed. Um, I've got all, some Jewish friends that I'm reaching out to. My studies, everything is changing. The way I study, uh, what I want to teach on, um, God's just giving me a bunch of cool stuff. I got more tools coming because I've only been on this for about two weeks and my mind is blown. Um, that story about Jesus bending down and writing in the sand just blew my mind what was really going on there. Um, the conversation between John fixing to die in prison and sending a message to Jesus and Jesus sending a message back. When you read that on Sunday morning at church, it sure sounds like, um, it sure sounds like Jesus is, uh, that John is saying, Jesus, I've spent my whole life, you know, 
chasing you, presenting the gospel, pointing people towards you, and now I'm fixing to die in prison. Are you really the coming one, or do we need to go look for somebody else? And it sounds like Jesus doesn't hear the question and just says something real cool in churchy, like, hey, the dead are going to raise, and uh, you know what? We're going to preach the news to the gospel. That's not even a legit conversation to me. And why? I have never questioned that before. I guess I didn't know what to question. Cody, I love you too, buddy. Thanks for being here, man. We're just wrapping up. Um, that conversation, now that I know the truth, that conversation doesn't even make sense. So how in the world, why did I never question that? Why did I never bring that up to a pastor or a mentor or whatever? Like, uh, the guy saying, Jesus, are you really who you said you are? Do I need to look for somebody else? And Jesus says, hey, tell my buddy that uh, the dead are going to rise and um, we're going to preach to the poor people. That's not even a logical conversation. And then we find out that both men are Jews. Both men have the Bible memorized. One guy is the Bible. And they're both alluding to the real conversation. And the real conversation is, Jesus, I know you're really the coming one. I know you're the one who rode in on the donkey. Am I going to get out of prison? And Jesus says, no, the, the dead are going to raise. Um, you're not getting out of prison, Jason. You're, uh, John, you're going to die in prison. That's the real conversation. So anyway, it just makes me wonder what else in the world are we missing? And I'm not hating on other preachers. I'm not hating on other teachers. Obviously, I've only been doing this 12 years and I'm just learning it. So I'm not mad at nobody else. There's no offense in my heart. I'm just, I'm juiced up. I'm pumped. I want to know what else is out there. I want to know. I want more tools. I want more Jewish buddies. I want, I want it, man. I want to, I want to play the game. And if you don't know the rules, you can't play the game. If you don't know the scripture, you can't understand illusions. I want in the game. I want to play the game. I want to know this stuff. I want to see what else we're missing. It excites me. And my hope and prayer over the last two weeks is that truck church, this concept of illusions, um, I pray that it's made you excited. And I pray that um, it makes you want to dig is what my prayer is over the last two weeks. If you Hopefully you learned some other stuff along the way. But if you didn't learn anything else, I pray that you walk away from the last two weeks of Truck Church hungry um, to go read, to go learn the text. I pray that the Bible is not boring to you anymore. I pray that it's exciting to you again, that you hunger and thirst for righteousness and to learn. That's, that, that's my prayer. So anyway, Kim, I tell Kim I love her too. So I'm going to pray and then I'll go back and read y'all's messages. So there we go. I love y'all very much. Thank y'all for riding with me so long. Hope you learned something. Uh, can't wait to read your comments and, and uh, see what y'all have to say. Lord God, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, Truck Church again. Thank you for your word. Thank you for stumbling upon this uh, teaching technique called illusions. Um, Ramez, thank you for my friends that are on here, Daniel who knows this stuff, BJ, um, and her husband, Lord God, I just thank you for friends that I do know that know about some of this stuff, Lord God, and, and I thank you for my friends that are deep, deep, deep friends that are deeply rooted in your word because it always encourages me to go dig more. Some people presented a, a question that's going to make me go dig. I probably am going to have to go dig it up before I go to sleep tonight because my brain's not going to shut off. You know, what was up with that man not getting pulled into the court? with that woman caught in adultery. So I got to figure that out. But just things like that, it's not even about being right or wrong. I just want to know, like, what's going on? Because I know enough about you and your word to know that you don't waste anything. Everything is intentional. Everything is on purpose. And God, man, your word is just making more and more sense every day. Um, people say that it's like an onion, it's layers. But man, I can't even compare it to an, an onion anymore. It's not even necessarily labor, uh, 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 a deal of layers to me anymore. It's the, do you know what the truth is? Do you know your roots? Do you know your culture? Do you know teaching techniques? It's not about layers. I guess you could say it's layers, but it's not even layers. It's your words just deep and you got to get all the way in the game and you got to be willing to learn the word and to live the word and teach the word and pray the word and die the word, Lord God. And I just, I, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that your word is not boring to me. I'm thankful that church is not boring to me. Church people are not boring to me. I'm thankful that you just reignite me all the time, Lord God, and get me juiced up and excited about your word. And I love teaching your word. And I thank you that you give me an ability to teach it in a way to where people understand it, can apply it. And hopefully my, my biggest prayer in teaching is that people would understand it in a way that they can turn around and teach it to someone else. That's my prayer um, every time I ever get to speak. So thank you for this amazing um, gift and calling that you've given me. And I pray that I would be a good steward of it and walk it out well. Um, even if it lands me in a position um, 
to where it would cost my life one day because we are definitely headed towards those days. So I pray that you would give me the strength and the courage to uh, walk this thing out to the very end, Lord God. And I just thank you for the honor of being saved, being called. Thank you for everybody that's watching now and later on the replay. And I pray that it just excites them to get in your word. And I pray that it makes people ask questions because um, questions make us dig deep. So bless everybody that's watching. You know all the things that we prayed about at the beginning of church. The young man who was lost, the grandma who has cancer, Katie's dad, her siblings that need to be saved. And um, there were several more prayer requests that came, Lord God. Thank you for hearing our prayers, answering our prayers, loving us. I pray for a blessed week this week, that we'd all be blessed, and that we would be a blessing to someone throughout this week, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Keep it coming, brother. Sam, I'm going to, man. I got to do some more digging, man. I've, I've given you what I've learned so far. So now I have to find the time to go digging some more so I can bring you all some more stuff. So uh, just pray for me that I, God would just keep revealing some cool stuff because I'm, I'm loving it, man. I'm, I'm juiced. I'm pumped. I just don't even know how much we've missed, man. <laughs> we've, we've missed a lot, bro. We have missed a lot. Cody, I love you, man. It just excites me to see you on here. Uh, what are y'all? Blessings and love, laughs from the hoods. Amen, amen. All right, I'm going to let y'all get out of here so I can read some messages real quick, and I'm going to take my butt to the house. So love y'all. Thank y'all for being here. Very, very thankful for Chuck Church and what God has done with it. Love all y'all amazing uh, friends of mine. God bless y'all. Good night.